about what God's done in your life as a couple, maybe, and as a family, how he's blessed you. And it's always good to, to see God's people and how they respond uh, to those situations. So anyway, we were at a wedding, and uh, I got to thinking while we were there about how encouraging it was to be with Christian people celebrating a marriage and, and uh, celebrating it around the Word of God. I mean, before I got saved, I went to many weddings and, and things, and, and they weren't really God-honoring, because the only thing that was God-honoring was the couple was there, and then there was no service to God after, there was no proclamation about serving God in their, of their lives. But when you go to a wedding and you see a Christian couple, and they're raised in a Christian home, and uh, knowing that they're going to blend their lives together to bring Jesus Christ the honor and glory, man, it just does something for you. Can, can I get an amen right there? You ever gone to a wedding like that and, and you just feel the presence of God? Uh, I did. And, uh, but I got to thinking uh, over the years, there's been a lot of times where I didn't feel encouraged. Amen? I may have gone to, like I said, I've gone to a, a, a wedding that wasn't encouraging or went to an event that wasn't encouraging. But I want to speak today just for a few moments about being encouraged and taking a look at uh, the Bible and a, a character in the Bible that really encouraged a lot of people and had an effect on many, many people and had, had an effect on half of the New Testament. And his name wasn't Paul, by the way, uh, but he worked with Paul. So we're going to talk a little bit about him, and I'll give you his name in just a minute. But you know, we think about Peter, we think about Paul, we think about all the key leaders in the church, and uh, we say to ourselves, well, those were great men of God. But you know something? They didn't do it alone, folks. They had encouragers and encouragement from others in order to accomplish what God would have for their ministries. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about today is a guy named Joseph. It's, it's spelled J-O-S-E-S -S in the Bible, but some pronounce it Joseph. It's another Joseph in the Bible. And without him, we might have never really heard of Paul. We might have never really had a large part of the New Testament penned. But uh, beginning in Acts chapter 4, and verse 32 and 37, we see an introduction to this gentleman named Joseph, who actually became Barnabas. His name was changed. Uh, you know, name changes are significant in the Bible. You all, you know, people that their names were changed and they had significant meaning because of that. But in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 through 37, the Bible says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which possessed was his own. Wow. They didn't talk about things that, and said, that, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. They never talked about anything that they possessed as their own, but they had all things common. And then in verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. In verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribu distribution was made unto every man according as he hath need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Introduction to, Bar to Barnabas. His name was changed here in the book of Acts, to the uh, being interpreted uh, the son of consolation or the son of comfort, the son of encouragement. His name was changed. Uh, uh, the, the apostles changed his name. And as we see that today, we're going to take a look at his life. We're going to see that he, as, as his name was changed, and he became one of the greatest encouragers in the Bible, and we all need encouragement from someone in our life, don't we? Boy, we certainly do. This brother needs encouragement. That's what, I come to church, I get encouraged by everything I see in this place. I don't look, I try not to look at the negative. We get focused sometimes on the negative, don't we? We see the empty chairs. We see sometimes people walking in that their, their, their faces are void of, of uh, and, and sometimes you have to look past that. 
and you say, this is a place, this is the hospital for God's people to get well and grow in grace and knowledge of our Savior. So I'm, I'm encouraged, and you ought to be encouraged every time you come through these doors. You ought to get encouraged when you get in your car and you put your foot on that gas pedal and you head to 1706 Old Goddard, Lincoln Park, Michigan. That's our, ad, that's our address, by the way. In case you don't know, in case you want to write that down, you want to text somebody where you go to church at, because that's what I do. I put 1706 Old Goddard, Lincoln Park, Michigan in my phone, and uh, once in a while, that encouragement brings someone into the house of God. You know, it's sadly, some of us have an easier time identifying key discouragers in our life than we do encouragers. It's just a fact. Human nature, we want to focus on those negative people that came our way, brought us negative things. And some of those same people brought you many positive things, didn't they? And yet, how do we, re we remind ourselves at times? The flesh kicks in and we say, that son of a gun did this. And we focus on that. There was a Phoenix comic strip. I found this. This is kind of a cool story. Linus has a comic strip, and of course he has a sister named Lucy, if you remember the Peanuts. Uh, they, they're still on, I think, uh, at uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. They still have those. Anyway, it's been a long time. Uh, now that they have the, the new cartoons out for kids, they get away from some of that stuff. But in the Linus in the, the Peanuts comic strip, Lucy uh, is faced by Linus, and Linus has written something, and he's, he's supposed to be funny. He says, Lucy, would you read this and tell me if you think it's funny? Of course, Lucy doesn't know that he wrote it at that point in time, and so Lucy's reading it. And in the next frame, uh, Lucy, you see she's grinning face to face. Obviously, she's laughing inside about what she just read that she ha that has written. And she looks at her brother, and she says, well, Linus, who wrote this? Who wrote this, Linus? And Linus sticks his chest out, and he says to, to uh, her, his sister, well, I wrote this, Lucy. And she says, well, if you wrote it, wads up the paper and throws it away. And she says, big sisters are the crab grass in the lawn of life. If, if, it, wasn't, if it would have been from anybody else, she would have laughed, but because it was from her brother, the attitude towards her brothers said, well, that's not funny at all. You know, there are times when we have encouraged others, and there are times like Lucy when we've been the crab grass in the lawn of someone else's life, have we not? Can you say guilty? I'll raise my toes up too, but I got shoes on, so. Guilty. You know, to be discouraged is to lose our courage or our to lose heart, we just, we do. We get discouraged. And we do that to others on a, on a regular basis. We just, all of us do as Christians. All of us can sit here today in this auditorium, we can think of some of the greatest encouragers in our life. I can think of my father and my, my mother who said, at the time I was, you know, five years old, you're going to college. I'm still sucking my thumb almost. <laughs> We're going to college. Okay, I'm going to college. Didn't really know what that meant, but I, I, I knew I was going to college. It was an encouragement to me as a young person. And I hope there's at least a couple of names that can come to your minds today as you sit here. It's who was an encourager to you? Who lifted up your spirit in a time when you needed it? Um, if you have any kind of healthy personality in life, if you... You are, are going to be one that needs a source of encouragement, not discouragement. You know, it, it, it's been said, the difference between an encourager and a discourager is that an encourager lights up a room by coming in, whereas a discourager lights up a room by leaving. Think about that. An encourager lights up a room by leaving, and a discourager lights it up by, lead, by leaving. But I want to tell you this morning, and I think you can agree, in God's creation, there is no man, no human, man, woman, boy, girl, child or otherwise, that is worthless. And everybody has the ability to be an encouragement to someone. Everybody has bad examples, and yet we focus, and we focus on them when, when it's those positive things that we have to see in people that God sees 
that God commands us that we should see in other people. No one else in this room, I hope, wants to be a source of discouragement, but in reality, we are at times. You know, I think of encourage. you know, you scream, we scream, we all scream for encouragement, not for ice cream. I know you have relatives that own an ice cream store. I like their ice cream, by the way. But we scream for encouragement in our lives. We do. We scream for affirmation. That's what we, God has built us that way, and that motivates us to work for Jesus Christ and to do the work of what God has called us to. In Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 11, the Bible says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. I tried to picture that this morning as I, I wrote this into my own. It wasn't part of it, and I, I thought, you know, we need to add to, fit words are encouraging, are they not? And so this verse of Scripture came to mind. I thought about, we, we, we can picture that, a beautiful silver basket, just the most ornate thing you can, you can think about with gold apples sitting in that. I mean, if you saw that, that would take your breath away. It, it would cause you to say, wow. I, I remember going over to uh, England, and we got to see the crown jewels. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to do that, but that was an amazing experience. I think uh, our son, Blake, was one and a half or two. He was very young, and we had the ability. We, we had the, I took my wife to, uh, on Mother's Day, we flew into uh, England or Paris or whatever. We went to Paris and went to, to London and Paris both. We took a shuttle under the across to, from one to the other. But I can still remember seeing those crown jewels. And we walked through that room, and it's, it, there's security everywhere, and you just, it takes your breath away. It was the most magnificent thing I've ever seen in terms of, of jewels. The crown jewels. Think about that. God's word said a word fitly spoken is like that. It's a wow moment. That's how important it is to speak words of affirmation to people. And, and, and think of the word of God. You know, sometimes, you know, it's great to think, that, like I said this morning, I, I said, well, what could I say right here in this out part of my outline? You know, we're talking about discouragement. We've got to sh shoot a little encouragement into this discouragement uh, teaching this morning. And I said, man, a word fitly spoken. The word of God just popped, and so I, I had to write this down. And that's how important it is to be able to use the word of God and to command it and, 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 and be able to quote it. And when it comes to mind... It works and, and works in people's lives as you use it. So if encouragement brings such hope, strength, and growth to our lives, how much are we giving? Man, how much encouragement are we giving? How much are we receiving? I wrote this down. Have you ever felt like you had just too much encouragement? Oh, I got too much encouragement, God. Just shut it down. I don't need no more. Uh, Brother, Brother Dobbs is bringing all the messages on, on Revelation. We're looking at the seven seals, the seven vials, and the seven trumpets. Now, that can be encouraging because you can use that to witness to your friends. That You all know my testimony, how that's how I got started reading the Word of God. But now, I can, now I'm encouraged because I'm not going to be around when that happens, amen? And I can use that to witness to my lost friends, relatives, and co-workers, amen? So we can never receive too much encouragement. I don't think so. But we looked at this scripture now in the book of Acts about someone who was so encouraging to others that the disciples gave him the name Son of Encouragement, because that's what that consolation means. They were so encouraged by him and what they saw in his acts that they renamed him and put a badge of him on him called the Son of Encouragement. Wow. Barnabas is given a new name like many other important characters in the Bible. And his name change was an acknowledgement of the transforming power of his presence in the lives of other people. Encouraging others was such a part of his DNA, I wrote, that he is called the Son of Encouragement. 
Let me ask yourself this question. If people in your family, your friends, or folks at church were to give you a nickname, what might it be? Now, some people don't like nicknames. Um, my, my, uh, I call my daughter, her name's Elena. I call her, uh, I'm not, now I'm going to draw a blank. So I, I call her, she calls me, Aaron, she calls me Daddy Erroneous. And I call her miscellaneous. <laughs> that has no reflection on her or I, but it's, it's a cute little nickname. Miscellaneous, you know, miscellaneous things, daddy erroneous. So maybe, maybe I'm erroneous in her eyes, I don't know. But what is the legacy that your words and behavior are going to leave in the lives of others? I, uh, at times I see on my Facebook feed or uh, my, my feed on my news feed, and I don't know what it is, but it seems like when you, we have feeds and you take a look at them, they keep repeating themselves. And, and if you're not new or if you're new to Facebook and those sorts of things, whenever you start looking at something like, oh, I, 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 need, a, uh, uh, I need some wood to, to, to do a project, and you click those, and, man, you just get tons of feeds of, of all the wood and where it's on sale, and it, they read your mind, okay? Those algorithms, they read your, they, they read your fingers. So um, at times I would click um, famous burial places. I don't, I don't, it just it showed up one time and I clicked it. And the next thing I knew, I was getting tons of feeds of, of, of famous burial places, okay? And uh, I said to myself, I just got to stop that because that is becoming over, it, it was becoming not overwhelming, but it was just too, too much. Like, where is so-and-so buried? Did you, do you want to know where so-and-so was buried? Click here. You want to see this burial plot? Click here. But uh, what we do and, and, and what we engage ourselves in can affect how we encourage others. The legacy of Barnabas was encouragement. Learning from his life and his examples, I want to share some Briefly, in the moments I have left, six characteristics of people that are encouraging. And I want to use the Bible to show what I'm talking about with respect to Barnabas. First, encouragers give freely of their resources. Encouragers give freely of their resources. Barnabas sold a field that he owned. The Bible doesn't tell us that he owned anything else or, or multiple fields. It says that he sold a field that he owned and gave all that money to the apostles so they could distribute the money to those in need. He was sold out for his resources. He shared his resources freely and invested his life and time in others. And if you read the, the accounts of him and everything that he did, we'll share a few more with you. But everywhere he went, everyone was always glad to see Barnabas. Always glad when Barnabas showed up. There was always a, a good word spoken or, or good information shared when Barnabas appeared on the scene. How we use our possessions, folks, demonstrates the reality of how much you love God. If you come to a service and there's a need mentioned, and God speaks to your heart, I don't care if you have five cents in your pocket to meet that towards that need. The widow gave everything she owned. If God touches your heart during a service, and I've had many times in my life as a Christian, where a need came up, and, and God just said, boop. I'm not going to argue with that, boop. <laughs> because I know it's going to knock me in the head if I don't listen to that. Multiple times, we've had singing groups, and we've had missionaries that have come, and sometimes we didn't have you know, a lot of meetings, but God spoke to me years ago about a sum. When a missionary shows up, I want you to give him that sum of money if, and, and if I've had it in my pocket, I've done it time in and time out. No, I don't say anything to anybody else. And I'm just sharing this with you because God's, this, this happened in my life many years ago when I saw a missionary speak. And God said, I want you to do this every time. And I've, I've tried to do that every single time to try to meet a need. Use your resources freely. Invest your time And I do notice when they come back, they are happy to see me, just like Barnabas. How we use our possessions demonstrates the reality of how much we really love God.
writing a note of appreciation. I can think of families that have written notes of appreciation to others in the church, and boy, we appreciate that so much, or, or, or birthday cards, anniversary cards, what, whatever kind of cards. That's an encouragement. It's tangible. You took your time to invest in someone. And we all appreciate that, and we need, to, we need to all continue to appreciate that. So not only do encouragers give freely like Barnabas did, but they accept us where we're at. I put down Acts chapter 9 in my outline here. We're gonna, I want to take a look at just a little bit of it. But Saul has a life-changing encounter with Christ. He goes from being a persecutor of, a church, of the church to a promoter. From persecutor to promoter. And in Acts chapter 9, I just want to skim down some of that chapter. I think Matt has it up on the screen for us. But I, I want you to see what happens, how Barnabas reacts to all this, because he's a true encourager of Paul here. And in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Man, this, he's got a hatred spirit, doesn't he? Before he became the apostle Paul. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has sent... He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many of this, of this man, how much evil he hath done to the saints of Jerusalem. Wow, think about that. Not only was he, he it was very well known what Paul had done. His, before he became the Paul, the, the, the doings of Paul were well known throughout the region. That man. Stay away from him. And in verse 14, And here he had an authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear the name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I'm going to drop down to verse number uh, 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwell at Damascus, proving that his, that this is very Christ. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but the laying wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And in verse 26, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But look at verse 27, and hang on. Who showed up? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to him how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus and was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Barnabas stood tall for the Apostle Paul when people were pointing out, that, what do you mean? You're embracing this man? He's just murdering people. And Barnabas basically said, I'm going to accept this man where he's at. I've seen and heard changes that have come about in his life. And he went about testifying of the changes 
in Paul to make him the acceptable in his message, acceptable to the Jewish people. Think about that for a minute. How many of you would do that for someone that you'd known had a change in their life? Maybe you have a, a friend that has come to Christ, and, and, but, but all their friends know just how dastardly they were in life. Would you go vouch for them and make a, make a claim? Would you lift up their banner and say, this person is different? Encouragers, accept us where we are and help us get to where we need to be. They don't dwell in our past or our reputation. Could you imagine if Barnabas had done that? Half of the New Testament may not have even been written because Paul would have not had that significance in the world if it wasn't for Barnabas doing all that. That's incredible. Barnabas spoke of Paul's experience of being confronted by Jesus and being changed. She vouched for Paul and said, look, this man is different. This man is, I've seen a new. We need to do that with our friends that we bring to Christ or our family members. Can you remember an incident when someone took a risk on your behalf and spoke up for you like Barnabas did for Paul? For Paul? How did that make you feel when they did that, when they spoke up for you? Encouragers accept us where we are, folks. Thirdly, a characteristic of an encourager is that they get excited about the progress of others. Turn to Acts chapter 11, uh, verse 19 for a moment, if you would. I think we have it up on the screen. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth who? Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a God, good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And much people was added unto the Lord, then departed Barnabas to, Tar to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught the people. And the disciples were Christians first in Antioch. I think that's so cool. Because of Barnabas and, and, and what he did and, 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 and the witness, it says here in Scripture, forever recorded, that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That's amazing to me. They encourage, encouragers encourage others to be excited about the progress of others. Who was going to follow up with these new believers, teaching them, helping them to grow? Barnabas, as you saw in the scripture, was there. Next, what else does an encourager do? Well, and first of all, to be an encourager, you've got to have a humble heart, folks. It's, it's, it's got to start with you realizing it's not about me, it's about my God. If I'm going to encourage anyone in Christian uh, to, 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 to live their, their life to be fulfilled in Christ, I have to be humble in doing it. You know, we think about good leaders and we think about, well, they have to have a strong ego or they have to have a strong self-interest. And that's what the world tells us. It, we look to people and someone says, well, they have a strong ego or they're just self-interested in themselves. But people that are actually have a humble heart are really incredibly ambitious, if you think about it. Uh, and I'm not talking about ambition for yourself, but ambition for others or ambition for where your workplace or, or where you may go. The, the fact that you have a humble heart in, in, in being an encourager 
you can work out that ambition to strengthen other people, to strengthen your workplace. Amen? Don't, I mean, when you go to work, you want your place to be able to have money to pay you, don't you? When you go to work, you want to make sure that, the, 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 that your boss and the, the, the place is functioning. But we have to understand that that humble heart works with your ambition then to instill encouragement in people as, you, uh, as you're out there in the world as a Christian. You know, if you read, there's many books written on leadership and uh, about how you have a good organization and you turn it into one that produces sustained great results. And if you read the majority even of secular books that talk about it, it talks about people that are ambitious, that desire a result not because of them, but they desire a result because it will aid multiple people in the end, not only the workplace, but it will aid your family, like I said, if you have a, a, a great uh, employment situation. So have a humble heart, and you'll be an encourager to someone wherever you go. Another characteristic of an encourager is they keep building unity, and I like that. I like the fact that when I come to Temple Baptist Church here in Lincoln Park, uh, we have a unified spirit here. Uh, we may be small in number, but I'll tell you what, we've got a big unified spirit here at Temple Baptist Church. We have people here that love the Lord, that want to encourage one another to build a work for Jesus Christ. And we recognize how much we really need each other, and that's important in being an encourager. Recognize how much you need your pastor, your pastor's wives. Recognize how much you need that fellowship to come in on Sunday. Man, that's an encouragement. It's more than the world will ever give you, ever. A million worlds won't give you that. But brothers and sisters in Christ do it. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, we see Barnabas and Saul, are they're basically in a multicultural group Worshiping, praying, and fasting together as a body of Christ, working together. And in that, uh, let's just take a look at that real quick, if you have that, Matt. Pro, uh, Acts chapter 13. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Nigger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And by the way, Herod the Tetrarch, he was of a lineage or part of the group that actually beheaded John the Baptist. Okay? So now he's joined ranks with the, the, the cause of Jesus Christ and Saul. And then in verse 2 it says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And in verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. <laughs> Encouragers build unity one to another. <clears throat> they, uh, you know, uh, encouragers will sow seeds of, di of, of encouragement, not seeds of discord amongst the brethren. If you're sowing seeds of discord amongst the brethren, you're not being an encourager to anybody, and more than likely, you are uh, grieving the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Don't make distinctions in your life based upon boundaries, nationalities, or distinctions that the world does. And I know that uh, we as Christians have to be real careful about that because the world's looking at us. But when people of different nationalities and distinctions, and uh, we have some that come through the door from time to time, and, they may not dress like we dress. They may not look like, like we do. But be an encouragement to them. Talk with them. Engage with them. I can't tell you the number of times that I've done that in my Christian life. Someone has come to the church that I, that, in the flesh, I was saying to myself, that just doesn't fit. Come on, how have you been guilty of that? That just doesn't fit. Well, I'm telling you something, you didn't fit once in Jesus Christ either. You weren't saved in a child of God. And God changed you. And someone encouraged you, and now look at your life. And so we have folks like that that come through the door from time to time. 
and give them, a, give them a second chance. Don't reach a conclusion because of what you see on the, on the surface. There's something deep that God wants to reach. And through your encouragement, you can reach what God has inside. There, there, God can put something through the Holy Spirit and get them saved. But the Bible says we all know that the, the, world, that may, the, world, the, the world around us cries out that there is a God. We know that those people that come through our doors have looked and they've, they've seen the handiwork of God. They just don't have through Jesus Christ in their heart. So be an encourager and, and understand that give others a second chance. In Acts chapter 15, I want to read this in closing, verses 36 through 41. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let's go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Isn't that interesting? Let's go see how they do. We, let's go back to where we were. Let, let's go see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take them, John, whose name, surname was Mark. But Paul thought not to take him with him, who departed from them to Phaphilia and went not with them to, uh, to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicily, confirming the churches. This point, this point of, his, of the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, they separated. Paul said, um, uh, Barnabas says, hey, uh, let's take John Mark with us. And, and, Sil and, and basically... Saul or Paul says, uh, no, he can't come. He, he left us abandoned before. He, he, he didn't get the job done. Let's just let him behind. Let, we're not taking him. It caused a division between Saul and, or Paul and Barnabas, and they went different. They went different way. And what did Barnabas do? He gave John Mark a second chance. He says, you know what, Saul or Paul, I keep using them interchangeably, you wouldn't take John Mark with you. But I'm taking him with me because I believe in second chances. I'm taking John Mark. You go your way. I'll go mine. We'll take our ministries to where it needs to go. And you know, in the end, in 2 Timothy, I'll close, I'm going to close with this. You know what Paul does? I think I wrote that scripture down. We have 2 Timothy. This is, what, this is the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy later on. He comes to his senses. He sees what Mark, John Mark has now done with Barnabas. He says, only Luke is with me, Paul says. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me in the ministry. What a revelation. I didn't give him a second chance. Barnabas did. I've just witnessed and heard all the great things that have happened now when John Mark, the man of second chances, went, <laughs> went with you, Barnabas. Hey, bring him along. He's profitable for me now. I didn't want nothing to do with him before. He doesn't say that. He'd bring him, bring him along. We'll get the job done. God's a God of second chances. Be an encourager. Give someone a second chance. Amen. His life spoke volumes of uh, Barnabas to, to being an encourager. Let's pray, and uh, we'll get ready for the next service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for being encouragement in your Word, Lord, through uh, Barnabas and his life, and for all that the, uh, the Bible, uh, he encouraged Paul, was a spokesman for him, that lifted him up before the people, and no doubt was an encouragement to cause and allow him to write half of the New Testament, Lord. We thank you for that. And we're not much is spoken about him. He's not the great marquee there in the book of Acts. Lord, he's not like Paul and Saul's name that we read over and over, but he accompanied Paul. He was a strong leader, Lord. He didn't take much credit, but yet you spoke of him to be an encouragement so that he could encourage us, Lord, in the day we live in. And the Bible could be an encouragement, Lord, as we take a look at his life. We ask that you bless our service today, Lord. Help us to build unity, to be an encourager, to have humble hearts. And most of all, we'd see people come to Jesus Christ as a result of the ministry. Thank you now, Lord, for this hour, and bless the hour to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.